Welcome all and thank you for joining today's AWRI webinar. My name is Marcel Essling and I'm a Senior Viticulturist at the AWRI. In this session, we will be discussing practical steps to counter fungicide resistance. In the spirit of reconciliation, the AWRI acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. I also acknowledge Wine Australia pro for providing funding and support for webinars by the AWRI Extension Project. Before we start, there's a couple of housekeeping things. If you would like to provide a comment or ask a question, please click on the Q&A button on the Zoom toolbar, type in your question and click send. We'll be holding the Q&A session at the end, but feel free to send in your questions at any time. A reminder also that this session is being recorded and the link will be sent through to you later via the AWRI's YouTube channel. We would also like to collect data today on your knowledge of this topic of fungicide resistance. You should see a question survey pop up onto your screen asking you to rate how much you know about fungicide resistance. If you could please rate your knowledge on this topic on the scale between zero to 10 now, with zero being nothing in terms of knowledge and to 10 being an expert in this topic. At the conclusion of today's webinar, after the Q&A, we will prompt you again with another single question to establish your knowledge on the topic after the webinar. Again, you'll be asked to rate your knowledge on the scale between zero and 10. So for anyone who's just joined, welcome. Today's webinar is Practical Steps to Counter Fungicide Resistance. And it's a great pleasure to welcome Barbara Hall and Liz Riley, who will be our presenters. So first up, we'll have Barbara and Barbara Hall is a plant pathologist with over 40 years of experience in diseases of horticultural crops. Having retired from SADI at the end of 2019, Barbara now does mentoring and report editing for two scientific research and agrochemical companies. Her areas of expertise in viticulture include diagnostics, management and control of fungal diseases, fungicide resistance, and extending information on disease management to growers. Barbara has extensive experience in the management of powdery mildew, downy mildew, and botrytis bunch rot. Barbara, if you're ready to make a start, I'll hand over to you. Okay, thank you, Marcel. I'll just get the science working, or the technology working. Okay, you've got my screen? Yes. Okay, so... Um, I'm just going to take you through a basic 101 in fungicide resistance to look at uh, how it develops and some of the aspects that you can manage to, to assist. So there's, there's two aspects to fungicide resistance, and many will have, have heard of this before. There's the resistance, which is the reduction in sensitivity to a fungicide by a fungus. Um, and what we're tending to call that now is reduced sensitivity because actually the definition of resistance is, is quite problematic. The second aspect is practical resistance when the label rates of a fungicide actually aren't providing commercially acceptable control anymore. And what we tend to call that now is field failure. It's when you actually see it just not working in the field. So how does resistance develop? For many, many years, this is the um, picture you would have seen, it's on the GWRDC, sorry, that's old fashioned, the Wine Australia and Wine Research Institute fact sheets. And it looks at a fact of the, um, there's always some mutations in the population which are resistant. And then by challenging with the fungicide, if those cells survive and reproduce, you gradually get a build up of the resistant population. But more and more what people are starting to investigate now and this is in the realm of molecular biology, and I don't under, propose to be an expert in this. I know enough to be dangerous and not much more. There's this emergence phase, which starts off first. And this is where these resistant mutations actually emerge. And there's not a lot known about how they emerge. They usually start when a new fungicide's introduced, and it ends when the population of resistant individuals is unlikely to die out um, by chance. So this emergence phase is something now that a lot of people are starting to look at and see if they can work out why and how these resistant mutations actually start to emerge. 
The next aspect of it is what we've always talked about resistance development, and that's actually the selection phase. So once you've got these resistant mutations, how do they actually select? And that's purely where we have the ability to make some sort of difference. And it's a population dynamics. You know, how good are the resistant ones? Are they fit? Are they um, healthy? Can they reproduce? And what sort of selection pressure is being put on by the fungicides that are being applied? It's really, really difficult to predict the development of resistance, both in uh, at the beginning, both in the emergence phase and in the selection phase. So cross resistance, it depends a lot on the mode of action of the fungicide, how it actually works, where it affect, affects the fungus, what target site is, the life cycle, how quickly does the um, fungus actually reproduce? The quicker it reproduces, the more chance you have to build up the populations. Cross resistance within a group is not perfect, but um, we have to assume that everything can be cross resistant at a population level. So in other words, for example, the new, <coughs> the SDHIs, some mutations that are developed by um, SDHI have full cross resistance. So they cover every single different type of SDHI, but many of them don't. There's over 27 different mutations reported to the SDHIs at the moment. There's three mutations reported in grapes and one of them is unique to grapes. It doesn't appear to occur in any other um, botrytis in any other crop or any other fungus in any other crop. But we have to assume that it could happen, it, that another mutation might occur that will then be cross resistant. So we've just got to take them all at one level, even though there are slight differences between the different ones. And that's why you'll see a lot of the DMIs are the same. And some of the new generation DMIs have a slightly different cross resistance to the others, but that doesn't change how you manage them as a resistance strategy. Fungicide resistance, this has been developed by FRAC, which is the head fungicide Res resistance action committee in Europe. And this decides, designates what the risk is for the fungicide and the pathogen to actually develop resistance. And on the left-hand axis, you'll see the risk of the actual fungicide. So down the bottom, you see the low multi-site action ones, your mancozebs, your copper, your chlorothalonil. We're not saying they'll never develop resistance, but it's rare and unlikely to happen. And then you go up through the um, things like the anilopyrimidines, the APs, the DMIs, which are a moderate risk. And then the ones that are the high risk, your QOIs, your, your phenylamides like Ritamil and your SDHIs. Across the bottom axis, you've got the actual pathogen. So things like Utica and Phomopsis have a very low resistance risk. It's unlikely that those fungus will develop resistance to the fungicides that have been using. And this is a lot to do with the biology of the fungus itself. Um, and that's a whole new topic for another hour, um, if anyone's particularly interested and not my area of expertise. Powdery mildew, the aerocyphes, are considered to be a moderate pathogen risk. And then your botrytis and your plasmopora, the downy mildew, are considered to be a high risk. And what you can do with this is, so for example, um, look at, think it as if you've got something that's a high risk like botrytis, and you're putting on a high risk fungicide like your QOIs or phenylamides, that's a much, much higher risk than if you're putting on those of the, um, of the powdery mildew. So it's just a way to look at, to say, okay, what am I putting on and what level of risk is, is being developed? And the um, people like Crop Life use this sort of information to develop their resistant management strategies. The prediction of development of resistance in that selection phase then comes back to your fungicide applications. How many you're putting on, when you're putting them on, what you're doing with the fungicide application. And this determines a lot with um, what you're going to develop, what the potential for resisting, for whoosh, resistance to develop. Sorry, my tongue is tripping over. Um, and so we'll just have a look at that. It, I haven't actually got any absolute data anymore. Um, 
if you want to look at what the actual numbers and figures of resistance that are found by the big project that Sardi and Curtin um, and Wine Australia are doing, um, there was a really good talk uh, 12 months or so ago by the scientists that were still working on that project that start looking at the actual numbers of what's resistant. What I've done is, is in the for practicality, I've just done a little summary of the current resistance status. So if we look at powdery mildew, there's actually not that bad an issue because we have a lot of fungicide choice in powdery mildew. So there's a lot of ability to mix and match your fungicides and reduce the fungicides that you might think are at risk. Reduced sensitivity has been detected in laboratory tests for nearly all the fungicides. Um, the exception so far is your Domark and Flute, um, but the caveat is there's only low numbers have been tested. The only field failure reports that we have is for the uh, trivoxystrobin, which is flint, and pyraclostrobin, which is cabrio, and a DMI mycobutanol. Um, there's no other bean field failure that's been confirmed. People might have been suspicious, but it hasn't actually been confirmed that resistance was the issue. So powdery mildew is not too bad a um, scenario because mainly because of the, the fungicide choice available that you can use. Downy mildew is a little bit more problematic. There's limited options of the fungicides. Um, there is definite field failure and resistance with your metal axle and your QOIs, and there's reduced sensitivity in nearly all the others. However, this uh, resistance is regional and it's very varied. So the testing that was done under this project was 0% resistance in some regions up to 100% in others. So it really depends a lot because downy mildew is a very weather driven disease. Your things like your hunter, um, which Liz will talk further about and your Yarra Valley and places like that, where you get a lot of rain and a lot of downy, they're far more at risk of having resistance issues than somewhere like the Riverland that hardly needs to spray at all. The testing for this is difficult because it's an obligate parasite. It only lives on living tissue. And some of the um, fungi like uh, fungicides like metal axle, they don't know what mutations actually confer the resistance. That still hasn't been determined. There are new products in the pipeline, so keep your eye out for them, but they really need to be nurtured and not be overused so that can they can be maintained. Botrytis is an interesting one. It's a very high risk and a lot of the fungicides that are used on it are high risk, but there's actually limited reports of field failure that have been proven to be caused by resistance. Most of it's because botrytis is such a difficult disease to control with fungicides. You really need to look at lots of the other um, cultural controls first. And I haven't got time to go into all of them and you've probably heard me preach them over and over again. There is reduced sensitivity in all groups, but the picture's not all that bad. Um, the Curtin group as part of the big project um, looked at 456 isolates throughout Australia and over 85% of them had no resistance detected. So there's, while there's reduced sensitivity to all around, uh, to most of the groups, um, and there was a couple of sites that had resistance to three of the modes of actions that are available. Um, there's actually low levels of um, severe resistance showing up. So that's a big advantage. Um, and if you think you've got resistance, testing is certainly relatively easy and it is relatively available. So proving field failure is difficult. Um, you've got to look at the fungicide choice. You've got to look at your timing and your coverage. And if you can say hand on heart that you chose the right fungicide, that you put it on at exactly the right time and that you had really good coverage and you're still not getting control, then it's certainly worth getting it testing. Um, this group at SARDI, um, and that's Ismail's email address is the person to contact offer testing under the project and they've just started a new phase of a, of a project. Um, and Syngenta are also doing a pilot project to look at QOI resistance. So it might be worth talking to them if you think QO's eyes are an issue in your, um, in your vineyard. 
The caveat I want to say in any sort of testing is that lab results on small numbers of samples is really difficult to prove anything to field performance. And that's because if you've got a population that you've got a few sensitive and you've got another population that you've got um, a lot of sensitive and you do a single test, you might purely by chance pick up a sensitive in both. And it doesn't give you a picture of what's actually happening. The second thing is, is that you might actually pick up the resistant. So you think, okay, I've got a resistant population, but you've actually by chance picked up a resistant in a quite a sensitive population. So the only way to do it is really to do mass numbers of testing. Statistics say that roughly 100 samples per block is what you need to get a good indication of whether you've got resistance in that block or not. That's a lot of samples to test and that can be a significant cost. The other problem is, is that people, researchers, don't always agree on what actually defines a resistant population. Um, and I'll just give an example. This was some work that was done on Ipridione many, many years ago. And all of those blue dots are 100 sample testing. So for example, the one right up the top that's at 95% in 2007, that means 95 out of 100 of those samples came up resistance. The ones down the bottom says zero. The problem is in France, they say, if you've got 15% of these samples, you've got, you can potentially get field failure. New Zealand work says it's got to be up to 60%. So the problem is, is that we really don't know at what level you're going to get field failure. All we can do is say there is a risk of it happening um, and you need to work with that risk. So how do we manage the risk? Um, the number one is also always follow the resistant management guidelines. They're outlined in the AWRI dog book. And yes, I did update. I realised the slide I had before was 1819 and I thought that was a bit late. Um, Crop Life Australia has all the resistance strategies on their website. But the basic thing is, is rotating or mixing different modes of action. We can't say this enough. The more you rotate and mix the different modes of action, the less selection pressure you put for that on that fungus by the fungicide. And I use that loosely because downy mildew is not a fungus, but we won't go there. It's an umycete, close enough. Using label rates, I'll discuss that a little bit later. Um, limit the total number of applications for a fungicide group. Now in the resistance management strategy, it'll quite clearly say no more than two, no more than three, no more than 30%, etc. You need to look at that. And if you've got a fungicide that you're thinking is a problem, reduce it or take it out completely if you can afford to. Educate yourself about the fungicide activity, the modes of action, the resistance. Um, there's a lot of information out there and you don't need to be a molecular biologist to understand the basic presets and rules. And the other thing that we always say is start a fungicide program with a multi-site. Um, to reduce the populations. The worst thing you can possibly do is put an at-risk fungicide on a well-established infection. That's just asking for problems. The other thing that we say very, um, from a pathologist's point of view, is correct identification is critical. If you don't actually know what you're spraying, you're probably not spraying the right thing. Um, and this has shown up a little bit. The two slides, um, the one on the right is downy mildew, the one on the left is not. So it's actually the bacteria infection. So you just need to be careful that you're actually spraying for the right thing and applying the right fungicide choice for the problem that you're having. Now, things to be aware of when you're doing fungicide uh, choice is off target use. Um, this is particularly where you've got something that controls both powdery and downy, for example, like Cabrio. And if you're spraying for powdery, the, if there is any downy there, it's still getting that spray. So you can't then use Cabrio for downy later on because it's already been used. You've got to assume that the diseases are there in your paddock when you're using it. Underdosing versus overdosing. There's been a lot of talk about, you know, you shouldn't underdose because it's bad. It's actually not. Um, that came out of actually the herbicide resistance um, area. 
and low dose reduces the risk of resistance development as long as you're getting effective control. So if you underdose and you're not getting effective control, you're causing a problem. If you overdose and, and put higher doses on, you can actually increase the resistance. So that's the one thing we say, be careful not to do. And a lot of this, unfortunately, depends on the fitness cost. Um, you know, how fit is this resistant mutation? If it's not very fit and dies out, well, it's not that, it's not as big an issue. If your mixtures versus alternations, um, I don't have any thing one way or the other, which is better. Um, a lot of fungicides will come out already mixed and they've spent a lot of work working out what the correct mixtures be to make effective mixing partners. But if you're putting out a, um, a fungicide that has two actives in it, and one of those actives you have resistance for, it means you're putting all the selection pressure on the other active. So you just have to be aware of it. Um, low dose QOIs with an, like your cabrios, the strobilurins with an effective partner have been proven overseas to reduce the selection pressure for the QOI. Um, so it's worth looking at. The one thing I will say, if you're looking at mixtures, though, is that you are, remember, you are wiping out two of the actives in one fell swoop. But generally, the resistant management strategy, if you're using effective mixtures, you can apply more of them than if you're using them solo. I just want to finish with a little thing. I was reading a 2021 review about strategy for resistance management. And one of the things that they said is that, uh, which is, most of you will understand very well, and those of us that talk to you um, can only help you with, is that it can only be successful, any strategies for management can only be successful if they're actually put into practice. And we understand that practical realities, um, imperfect understanding, conflicting priorities, um, what you're trying to manage will define what you actually do. And so the last slide before I hand over to someone that can help you with some of this, um, is their final point was that communication with farmers, i.e. you, is an aspect of resistant management that we must not overlook. Um, and so from that point, I will hand over to Liz to help you with some of that communication. Back to you, Marcel. Thank you, Barbara. Yeah, look, thanks again. I will introduce this Riley in just a moment, but thanks, Barbara, for providing that background to fungicide resistance. Um, it's good to know where we sit in terms of resistance for our key fungal pathogens and also for some guidelines into how to make sure that we don't get resistance. I will introduce Liz Riley. Liz is known to us all, I'm sure, but Liz is an independent viticulture consultant based in the Hunter Valley who works across New South Wales. In addition to viticultural consulting, uh, Liz works as a contract trainer with Tokal College to develop and deliver viticulture training to the New South Wales wine industry. Liz has over 25 years of experience in the wine industry with expertise in pest and disease management, agrochemicals and biosecurity. Liz, if you're ready to make a start, we look forward to hearing some of your insights and I'll hand over to you. All righty, hopefully that screens up and sharing. Um, so thanks, Barb. That was a great lead up to, I guess, the, the practical grassroots um, approaches to avoiding fungicide resistance. And I think that's probably where I want to start this is you know I, I work primarily in a high risk region in a drought year we'll do seven sprays in a wet year we might do 15 or 16. So you know we're constantly under pressure with those those top end um, vulnerable diseases of downy and, and botrytis. So you know field failure pops up in my life here and there. Um, you know we see it occasionally in the hunter but I often see it in other parts of New South Wales when the phone rings and goes, oh, we think we've got a problem. Um, and, and as I go through this talk, you know, it, it, I don't think we do have true field failure in a lot of places. When you do the detective work, there's something else that, that's going on. So thanks for setting that scene, Barb. Um, 
So let's get this moving a lot. Slides. Why aren't we moving? Have you got a different slide there? No. Okay. Okay, now. Okay. So for me, prevention is always better than cure. Um, obviously, in the in the top left there, we've got site setup, you know, having good airflow, having good training and trellising, the cultural practices you do, you know, making sure your canopies are managed both for drying and, and getting keeping disease pressure low and having good airflow. So that's where weed control comes in, but also um you know, things you do to open up canopy, so leaf removal, shoot removal if you're in a in a wet, high risk season. So airflow and drying are really re really critical. And I think for people to expect that fungicides are going to be the panacea is a little bit naive. You know, you've really got to be working on everything in your vineyard to help manage this. So the key, th key things for me with fungicides is it's about your coverage. It's about understanding the difference between protectant and post-infection chemistry. Um, and all the chemical options that you have. But again, you need to know your enemy and understand what makes them work and what creates that pressure because that impacts on how you use them. So, you know, obviously with downy, it's knowing about what creates infection pressure um, and, and again, how you tackle that. Powdery mildew is always there simmering away. So again, what your strategy is. Botrytis is a friend of downy mildew. Um, and you know, certainly in the last season where we all had a lot of wetness and a lot of downy, you, you're setting yourself up for botrytis. So you, you've got to manage one to help minimize the risk of the other, but that doesn't mean you can't get botrytis without having downy. Um, and Phomopsis, certainly I think a few of us got caught this season with how wet it was. Um, and that popping up is probably a problem we haven't had for a while. Okay, so application is everything and um, thanks to Bob for not covering this one in great detail um, but coverage 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 and for me that again there's a whole lot of facets of coverage I think everyone wants to think about physical coverage and and are we getting chemistry on where we want it backs and fronts of leaves um, is it getting into bunches have you got it on when you've had good dry conditions were you spraying when it was a bit windy and maybe it didn't actually all go where you thought so physical coverage is important, and that's obviously how you spread your set your sprayer up in terms of you know where you have fans and jets and what you have turned off or turned on. Um, but dose and interval are equally important. So dose is about the right race, right rate. And it was interesting to have Barb talk about you know underdosing and overdosing. Some fungicides have a range of rates. Um, you know, it might be you know 20 grams per hundred liters or 40 grams per hundred liters. And that gives you scope, obviously, depending on the pressure. So if you're in a high pressure season, you know, those chemistry companies will tell you to use the top rate. And if it's a drought year, you can go with that lower rate. So that's reflecting, um, you know, that pressure. And I would argue that that manages that underdosing and overdosing. But I think where we get into a real underdosing issue, and I guess this is what I see in my day-to-day -day professional life, is where people have had failure and you go back and look through their spray records, they haven't understood the difference between dilute and concentrate spraying and the need, if you're concentrate spraying, to be um, you know, using a concentration factor in, in your calculation. So you can have quite significant underdosing if you don't get that right. So for anyone who's um, younger than I am and may not have ever seen a dilute sprayer, dilute spraying was when you um, you sprayed with your sprayer to the point of runoff. So, um, you know, the water volume literally had to wet the whole canopy and water just started to drip off the leaf. Most of the new sprayers we have now, you know, we'll use the, the Croplands Quantum Mist as an example, are dilute spraying. So we're not using the same amount of water. So let's just say, looking at the canopy behind me, with a dilute sprayer, that might have been a thousand litres of water. We may spray that with a concentrate sprayer with only 500 litres of water. So therefore, when you're calculating out how much chemistry to put in the tank, your concentration factor is two. So when you read the label, there will be, a, for any bit of ag chem, there will be a conversation about what that concentration factor is. 
So if you're too young to know about dilute spraying, ask someone older how much water they would have put on if you need some guidance. Um, so that, that dose part is really, really important. And that's that's literally always where someone rings me up and says there's a problem. That is what comes to light as the issue. The other one um, is interval. Um, so, you know, a lot of us like to work on calendar spraying of two weeks, just, you know, for a nice, easy number. But when you have rapid growth, high disease pressure, or you have incoming weather, you need to be adaptive with that interval. So if you've got, um, if you're at day six and your canopy volume has increased by, I don't know, 20% and there's 50 mils of rain coming, you have got unprotected foliage from a downy mildew point of view. So if you, um, you know, really, really, you know, you need to be on the front foot and, and maintain that that cover. So interval becomes important if you have pressure, um, certainly for the wet diseases, probably for powdery, and Bob might want to comment on this at the end, it's working out if powdery is just lurking there in the background, how, how big an interval you can take before it becomes an issue. And I think that probably depends on season and humidity. So, um, yeah, I think all of those things come into play um, in terms of application. So coverage, what can you do? Um, so this is really talking about um, all, all of those aspects. Um, so check your physical coverage. Go out there with some sunscreen. Um, I have a whole lot of vineyard managers who curse me when I say this, and I often suggest they do it just before flowering. And you should be able to see, hopefully, in those pictures that um, that inflorescence there has what I think is pretty good coverage. And I can see... Um, sunscreen into the rachis on those little flowers. So the upside of doing this kind of work prior to flowering is if you're not getting that coverage, you know, A, you haven't been getting adequate coverage up until that point. It's probably the last chance you've really got to try and make sure you keep things clean as you go into flowering. So, you know, that that's really important. Again, it's seeing coverage on the back and front of leaves um, and are things shingling or, or, or is your pressure, water volume, everything going where you think it is? Um, so yeah, just mix up a part tank. You don't have to make 3000 liters of sunscreen, um, but I think this, this is a really fiddly, but very valuable exercise to do. If you're not sure about concentration factors, if you're not sure about calculations, find out who in your, your your region can help you. It might be another vineyard person. It might be a reseller. It might be a consultant. But again, um, people often get a bit upset when they get the calculations right and they look at their chemistry bill, but there's no point paying cheap and getting an ineffective result. So make sure you calculate things out. Um, and in terms of interval, that watching growth, keeping an eye on the forecast and maintaining um, protectant cover before wet weather events is is really, really important. Um, can't stress that enough. So that rolls on to that timing question quite nicely. And I'm just gonna kind of, I guess, unpack the role of protectant versus post-infection fungicide. So protectants provide you with cover before an infection event. So they're putting something in place that's gonna stop fungus sporulating or getting out of control. So where you therefore get new growth, your vines grow out of cover. So, you know, there is that period not much before flowering where canopies literally double in a week. You can end up with 50% of your canopy having no cover. Um, and that means, I guess, in effect, you are underdosing. You're, you're putting out a rate that's insufficient for that, particularly if the canopy has doubled, it's actually only got half as much fungicide on it. And there are areas that don't have cover. So you need to be doing reapplication. Um, and that is challenging if you've got lots of days in a, in a period where you can't spray. So whether it's raining or whether it's windy um, or you don't have access for some other reason. Um, and I guess for me, that is where post-infection fungicides are complementary. So if you're going to get two thirds of the way around your vineyard before a weather event hits, that is probably where you're then going to need a post-infection fungicide to help you regain control. Um, I struggle where people's approach is, well, we'll wait for the infection event and then we'll go out with a post-infection fungicide. You know, we don't have very many true post-infection fungicides. So that's where people get into strife. So the, the two most commonly talked about post-infection fungicides are 
pulse acid and metal axle for downy mildew. Um, there are plenty of products out there that um, definitely have some post-infection properties, but they are not registered for that purpose because they are built to be protectants, not to be post-infection fungicides. And um, Barb might comment on that again at the end, but that's that's where we get into trouble. If we want to maintain the sweeter chemistry we have, you've got to use it proactively rather than reactively. Um, so for me, it's, it's when you get out of cover, but ideally not using that as your plan. It, it's really a um, mopping up exercise. Um, there is often, you know, particularly with metal axle, if you're going to have to use it in that way, um, it's about applying it before all spots appear, appear. So you have an infection event and then you have, you know, between three, four, five, six days before oil spots appear, depending on your temperature. It's about getting that on before that occurs. Um, my experience in the Hunter, which is really wet, and we've definitely had a number of high pressure years in the last decade, is the outcome when you apply post-infection fungicides to dry foliage or dry inflorescences compared to things with moisture on it is massive. Um, it doesn't really get talked about, but certainly my field experience is putting out anything post-infection onto wet foliage and wet inflorescences will not give you the control you're hoping for. Um, so if you want a good result, and you can see in that picture, you know, that's an oil spot that has got good post-infection control. We know when things are, you know, constantly wet, we often will see um, control in the middle, but we, we just see a creeping infection that keeps getting away. So um, it's really important. Um, so reiterating that point I made before is that um, some protectants do have post-infection control properties, but this really does compromise them for the long term. And I think when we have high pressure seasons, we see, you know, certainly with the years when Cabrio came out, that really got used, I think, quite, um, quite openly by people as something to clean up downy that was getting away. And I think there's probably a few other products out there at the moment that have been put under the same pressure this year. That's kind of riding a ticket to it not being in the arsenal for the longer term. So, um, you know, Barb's comment that we need to nurture chemistry, for me, it's preserve chemistry. And that that goes into where I'm going now with how I build a, build a program. Um, so chemical selection and planning, um, as Barb mentioned, we've got the Bible here, the dog book. It's been around for 20 plus years now. Um, and, and that's a really, really important resource, whether you're exporting or not, it, it contains a lot of useful information. So obviously when you're writing a program, it is actually about having a program, not just ad hoc decisions about what you're doing. You, you need to have a game plan so that you're managing that risk and, and preserving chemistry. So obviously if you're organic, your options are a lot, um, are fairly restricted, but if you're doing a conventional or sustainable program, um, obviously you've got some options. So the first thing you do need to consider is your market and the winery specifications you have. So for some people that might be the domestic label withholding period. For most people, it's the dog book or their winery specifications, which might give you an extended withholding period over and above the dog book. Um, the crop life management strategies that Barb referred to, they sit in the dog book and they're updated each year. Um, or you know, with the most current recommendations that are available, that the dog book goes to press. Um, and then you actually need to consider all the other operational parts of using your protectants, like any weather considerations. So you might write a plan and the weather may mean that you need to review that plan and change it, but it, a plan is a good place to start. You need to consider what kind of chemistry it is. Is it contact, systemic, translaminar? And the activity group is really the most important part because that's what we're trying to preserve is have those different activity groups and modes of action. Um, and cost definitely comes into play and I'd really encourage you to be informed. So don't just take your reseller's work, word for it, get some pricing, work out your cost per hectare at different water rates as you're using it through the season. So the dog book gives you a lot of tools. The crop life strategies for me um, are pretty generous. I probably work a bit more leanly um, than those, uh, and I'll go into that in a moment. And just to Barb's comment about um, rotation versus tank mixing chemistry to preserve it, that's probably where that cost factor really comes in. In some ways, it's often cheaper to be able to rotate 
different groups, then tank mixing is where it starts to get pretty expensive. So um, this is, I guess, a comparison of what crop life might suggest and what I do in practice, which they're not that different. Um, so crop life is very um, firm that it is about working preventatively, which again, we're on the same page. Uh, they suggest often that an, an active or a mode of action might need tank mixing. There'll be a maximum number of sprays recommended for a group. Um, and there may be restrictions on the number per season or in consecutive seasons. They may have a suggestion or recommendation about the timing. And really pleasingly, they also say that cultural methods are important to help you achieve control. Um, so in practice, cultural methods are at the top of the list for me. You know, that, that's the things you've got to be on top of. Um, when I'm writing a program, I'm working backwards, considering the withholding periods, either in the dog book or winery specs. I, I really use um, multi-site fungicides as a core, and then it's about working out where I want to slot in um, more of those single-site um, uh, fungicide groups. I like to use quite a few groups, but I like to try and only use each group once. Um, that came under pressure a bit this year when we needed extra sprays, but you know, when you work back with withholding periods, often things fall out um, and, and it makes sense to use a certain group early in the season, certain groups around flowering and then certain groups that have shorter withholding periods post flowering. Um, it's really, really important to consider how your seasons roll over. Um, so if you're finishing with certain groups, they're probably not the groups you want to start the next season with. And again, Barb's comment about not starting the season with a single site fungicide is a really good one. I haven't heard that before. So that's um, that's a really good takeaway and, and start with a multi-site and, and try and keep your pressure down. Um, it's targeted timing. So, you know, some spraying needs to be kind of calendar spraying when you're in rapid growth, but you might need to manage those intervals. Um, and, and to be brutally honest, it, particularly in a wet season, it, it's go hard, go early because it only ever comes unstuck if you wait. Um, the most fatal words anyone ever says to me are, I'm just going to wait and see, Liz, just going to wait and see, because usually that's when problems start to escalate and then you, you're no longer in control. So when things are out of control, do you have resistance? Um, you know, and I think many of us who work as consultants or resellers get people coming in because they, they believe they've got field failure, which means they've got disease. And again, it's about reviewing and unpacking what you've done. Go back and look at timing, intervals. Did you have cover on before an infection period? And, and you really need to forensically unpack dose. Did you get the right rate? Did you have the right water volume? Did you have your concentration factors in play? And then look at that physical coverage. Um, you know, all of those things need to be reviewed. So. If you review that and everything is absolutely spot on, well, yes, maybe then the chemistry is the culprit, but nine times out of 10, it's something to do with application. Um, so you also need to consider when you are investigating, if you think it's the chemistry, is it something you've done? That's when your program comes in, in for review. Have you had rotation or have you had high use of a single group? So you might've used one group a lot of times, um, and again, for me, one of the, the few times we've had field failure confirmed, it was where someone really, um, really flogged a product or flogged a group, um, and, and that that popped up. But yeah, I think ke chemistry gets a bit of a bad rap because it's often something else. So if you think you have resistance, eliminate all those possibilities of application failure, and then investigate testing. So Barb um, put up the slide for the Sardi contact Ismail. Um, and I think Syngenta are going to have something um, in play this season. They tried to get it going last season, but I think we were all too busy trying to manage disease. So, yeah, it's absolutely worth, worth testing. Um, I've been really fortunate to be a, um, a supplier to the fungicide resistance project over the years, and it's really valuable information to get back. Um, I guess the irony is we're always sending in the highest pressure samples we can find. Um, and... You know, it's, it's really pleasing when you, you get results that show you've got good sensitivity because you have confidence that your program's working. I definitely have had samples come back with resistance and I've had samples come back with loss of sensitivity. And that, it does make you take stock. Um, for me, it means for certain periods, like through flowering, 
I really consciously try and rotate activity groups on a biannual basis. So I might use certain activity groups this year, not use them the following year, and then you know swap two things backwards and forwards, which um, I think some of my ad chem um, company connections kind of go, really? And I'm like, yeah, I, I really want that to be preserved. And I guess that comes off starting my career when we we had really massive failure of a, you know the dicarboxamides and benzimidazole fungicides. So when you don't have any options, you get very good at preserving what's out there. Um, so the bottom lines, this is my last slide. It, it is really about reviewing application. It's about making sure you plan your program and being proactive rather than reactive when you can, which is not, not always easy. Um, so I don't think this is, is rocket science people. I think it's, it's really attention to detail, spending some time planning. Um, and I've just got this little video, which is a really sage reminder of by the time you get to Verizon on onwards, you are really going to struggle to get coverage. So we all like to think it's pretty good, but it's not always there. So um, the go hard, go early is, is really important. I think that's it for me, Marcel. Thanks very much, Liz. That was terrific. Um... We really do benefit from your experience. So let me wait until I can get my video started. So again, to anybody who's got any questions, please feel free to go onto that Zoom toolbar and um, enter by typing and sending any questions you have. Um, Liz, again, thank you. You've covered a lot of important messages and um, we look forward to any questions people have. I'll invite Liz and Barbara now to access their microphones to answer any questions and I'll just go through the ones that have come through. And to Liz and Barbara, you can also look at those questions. We've got a question first up about the importance of adjuvants and I'm happy for either of you or both of you to give us your thoughts on those. Uh, look, I, I, I tend to work with my reseller on that. Um, a lot of products come formulated with adjuvants. Uh, we have played a bit with some of those um, newer, I'm trying to think of what the what they're called, the slip, more slippery ones at the back end of the season. But nine times out of 10, I'm, I'm spraying whole canopy, not just fruit zones. So we, we're generally just running with what we might need as a buffer in water and, and what those products come formulated with. And I, I would agree with that, Liz. I think um, before you add an adjuvant, you really need to talk to the um, chem the company about the chemical and say, does this need an adjuvant? What will happen if I put an adjuvant with it? And look at what disease you're working with and what stage it is. Um, some of the really heavy infections, if you're trying to wash them off, um, hopefully with not a high risk multi uh, single site fungicide, um, things like downy and powdery, if they're very thick, you will need an adjuvant because they're hydrophobic, which means the water will just run off them. Um, but I don't wholesale recommend adjuvants for everything. I think you really need to look at the chemistry you're putting on because there's usually a lot of work done by the companies as to what's the best adjuvant and how to use it. Thank you. Do either of you have any thoughts on the use of paraffinic oils and potassium soaps to assist in stalling resistance? Um, there's a lot of questions being asked about looking at alternatives to try and reduce resistance. Um, it, it really, theoretically, anything that will kill the fungus um, and reduce the amount that's there will help reduce the sensitive as well as the resistant populations. But it's a balance, it's a population balance. So it'll kill them both off. But if it doesn't work very well, um, you're not going to get control of those resistant individuals the same as you're not going to get control of the sensitive individuals, um, if that makes sense. So as a resistance management strategy, it's looking at, at, at potentially keeping some of the higher end, high risk fungicides usable because you're not using them and not providing extra pressure from them, but it's really a case of do they work? And if they don't work, you're not helping. If you can get control with them, um, it will 
save some of the high risk fungicides, but whether it actually reduces the resistance risk is still a big question. I guess just following on from that, Bob, you know, my experience is, you know, I've got, I don't know, I've got vineyards now that I've been running or been involved in for 20 years where we've been using that rotation. We are not seeing a loss of sensitivity. So I think when you use them the right way, you know, I certainly have confidence that they're still doing the job. And I'm, and I'm under a lot of pressure. Yeah. Thank you. The next question we have is on concentration factors. So I guess directed a little bit at you, Liz, because you spoke to this. Um, should retailers be encouraged to move away from advising on a rate per hectare? And should there be a concentration factor for canopy density is the question. Uh, yes and yes. So um, I know the, the person who's asked this question and, and it was probably something I hadn't ever thought of until this year. Um, I, I think, you know, the default going back to rate per hectare is probably obsolete to a point now that we've moved to concentrate spraying. Yeah. Um, and I think where we have those higher density vineyards, yes, there probably does need to be a second layer of concentration factor added. Um, and it's probably something that might be a useful small project to try and work out how you work that out. You know, traditionally, I think we work that that stuff on you know three metre rows rather than yeah. say 2.4 or even less where people are in, in narrower situations. So yeah, yeah I think there, there probably is some work to, to be done there. From my experience with labels, most labels these days do have a rate per 100 um, litres and it's not that common to see rates per hectare anymore. And so I think it's understanding how to get good coverage based on the canopy that you've got and the number and the distance of rows per hectare. But it is it is quite a complex topic and we do see yeah. um, that there is some extension that's required to get people understanding this a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. Just don't ask me, my calculations are hopeless. Yeah, it, 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 it does require a bit of headspace and I think it, it'd probably be good if we could try and even just come up with a ready reckoner if you're running this row spacing and this row spacing. This is what you might need, might need to up it to. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think that's a hard piece of work. It's just um, one that needs to be done and then made available. The challenge is that the canopy size varies um, sure. across across seasons yeah. and, and vineyards. Uh, there's a question of um, can I use any sunscreen product? Um, I would think so. Like I, you know, I. I use Surround because it's commercially available, it's registered, um, and it's yeah. easy to play with. But if you've got something that gives you visibility, yeah, as long as it's not going to clag up or damage your sprayer and nozzles, I would think you'd be right. Uh, obviously, it technically needs to be registered if you're putting it out in a, a crop you're going to pick. Thank you, Liz. And yeah, just to clarify that, um, when... It was, a, it was a few years ago when sunscreens were first coming out and we had lots of different products on the market. Um, the AWRI did get them to supply fruit that had, had had the sunscreens applied and we put it through fermentation and wine sensory work to make sure that there wasn't any impact. Some of these sunscreens, for instance, might contain an aluminium um, structure. And so therefore we just wanted to make sure that there was nothing happening. So if there's a new product out there that people are using, um, it's worth double checking that there's no impact on fermentation. Uh, Barbara, I think this one sounds like it's one for you. Does 10, 10, 24 for downy mildew need to be totally revised? I don't think it needs to be totally revised. I think what it needs to be is people should not accept it and not use it as the definitive absolute. So 10, 10, 24 was developed. It was very effective at the time. Yes, it is a bit old fashioned, but it still works as a basic rule, but you've got to think about your area. So if you're in a cooler weather area, you probably don't need, you could, it, it, the downy can probably come in a slightly cooler temperature. So I usually say to people, look at what you, you know, if you're in a warm weather area, 10, 10, 24 still works quite well, and that's roughly good. But if you're in a cooler weather area, you, maybe you need to look at eight degrees. The thing about downy mildew is it needs around about 16 hours of moisture in the soil for the ooze spores that are living in the soil to germinate. 
then it needs about another eight hours of water splash for those germinating ooze spores to get up to foliage. So that's where the 10 mils comes from. But if you've got moisture from, um, if your soil is very wet and then you, and the ooze spores are germinating, but you might, the moisture might have come from the previous day, but the soil's still wet. And then you get a rain in that last little bit that splashes it up. You may not need the full 10 mils in that one day. Um, does it need to be clinically revised? No, I just think you need to be more aware of what's happening in your area and look at say, okay, I'm in a cooler weather area. The weather over the last 48 hours has been very wet. So maybe I don't need 10 mils in this particular day when the temperature warms up a bit and I have a bit of rain. Oh, my, my experience is eight degrees is enough for us. You know, if it dips to eight yeah. degrees for a few hours. And I think, I think it's more about understanding that, that 10, 10, 24 is not a hard thing, that if you're eight degrees for two hours, you go, oh, I didn't technically meet that. Yeah. yeah. My, my, my answer to people is if you think you've had a primary, you have had a primary um, because somewhere you will have it. There'll be a spot that's low or a spot that didn't have enough cover or it grew a bit fast. If you're on the edge, err on the side of caution and go hard, go early, because that is literally where it all comes on. And, and once Jeannie, once Downey's out of the bottle, it's like a genie out of the bottle. You can't put it back in because once you've got one primary, you just keep, it just keeps going. Um, so um, we had six primaries prior to, bud, uh, prior to flowering last season and we worked really hard to keep it in the bottle because once it was out, it was out. Um, so I think, I think it's just, language around 10, 10, 24. But it would be really interesting to know if there has been an evolution of downy in Australia and we are more vulnerable. Barb, you could come out of retirement. <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks very much uh, to you both for answering that question. Um, we've got a comment here uh, just about not spraying the same group at the end of one season and then again at the start of the next season i guess you both agree with that yeah. concept and i think it might have been mentioned um got another question people were critical of metal axle this year under the high pressure that it was under and they've used the comment about floods mostly where neighbors had failures next to others that were successful do you think this can all be put down to timing and application more than any resistance I think the answer is both. Um, where people were able to maintain protectant cover, um, they were definitely in a better position. So some people who would have had failure with metal axle probably already had a really significant population of downy. But that said, for people who've only been able to use metal axle for the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years because they've not been able to use FOSS acid. Yeah, I think undoubtedly we know there's some metal axle resistance out there. Um, so it's both. You know, certainly if, if that was your only option and you were out of cover and you had downy getting away, you may well have resistance. But but certainly I had I had vineyards next to each other where people maintain protectant cover, they got a crop off. People couldn't maintain protectant cover um they didn't get a crop off so you know i think there's a few permutations there the other thing that um we found in the in the times that i was working on it is that downy um while it can spread between vineyards most of the infection comes from within your vineyard and one of the things that we found with resistance is it can be very very localized um, so that if you can have a resistant patch in one vineyard and the patch next door may not have the resistance. So as well as the coverage, you've got to look at that as the fact that this person might not have resistance and that's why they're still getting the good coverage. Um, yes, it can spread between vineyards, but work has shown that usually 90 to 95% comes from within your own vineyard. Uh, we have a comment from Ismail Ismail. Ismail is the researcher who represents um, South Australia and Persa in this project. There are other project leads as well as Ismail. And Ismail just wanted to make the point um, that he uses the field rate or the label rate in the tests in the lab to decide if the sample is has resistance or just re reduced sensitivity or if it is still sensitive. 
We have a question about biologicals coming on the market and how, how useful they are. I don't know if either of you would like to comment. I would just make the point that they any product that is registered for use in Australia has been shown to be um, efficacious, that it works. Otherwise, it wouldn't get the registration in the first instance. But happy to hear from you, Barbara or... Is, is this the question about are they useful whether they work or are they useful in resistance management? Um, are they useful when they work? Yes. If they work and they work for you, um, fantastic. Really good idea. Because what they do is they do, if they work and they control the disease, um, they reduce the press selection pressure you're putting on by the other fungicides. Whether they actually reduce the resistant individual over the sensitive individual and change the population um, ratio, uh, I don't. I think the jury's still out on that. We don't have enough detail about that. But as a strategy to extend the life of the at-risk fungicides by reducing their use, yes, as long yeah, as you that, get the control. That, that, that's really interesting. So pre-biologicals and, and when we had the ability to use Captan and Iprodione late in the season, I would have potentially used four different groups for my Petrolis control. Now I use two groups and then biologicals for the back end, which is actually interesting because it's probably made me go, well, I'm back to two groups, not four, um, but I'm getting really good control. But I guess it's it, there's a couple of things. It's about understanding what gives you success with the biologicals, and I'm really wrapped in them, my, my commercial experience, um, and I don't I, I kind of have a couple I prefer, but th there's some rules, I guess, that underpin using them. So the, the chemical companies that put them out don't advocate you use them as the solo mechanism, but it's that you use conventional chemistry in the high risk period, so around flowering. But I think it's also understanding they're complementary. A fungicide or a botrytocide kills botrytis. A biological is arguably competing for real estate, you know, where there's micro wounds and fissures, as well as having an impact on the botrytis. So I think, I think you've got to understand where they fit and how you use them. Um, but, but I think it, it's actually quite interesting. I'm probably now a little more concerned about just using two groups and, and then using those. So whether we do need to be thinking about that is a, is a really good thing to ponder. And the other thing I would say, and I know I'm probably preaching to the converted, but if you are using biologicals, please be careful of what you tank mix them with. Because I've yeah. seen some very interesting, spectacular tank mixtures that render the biological completely useless. Yeah. And, and yeah, so getting that physical compatibility and biological yeah. compatibility, you know, those, those guides are out there. Um, and I, I use two different biologicals because they have different compatibilities. And I, I like mm. that agility. Um, one, one works with false acid and one doesn't. So that for me was a bit of a game changer and how I approached it. Thank you. Um, we do have a comment here. Uh, there is an app, the Syngenta Hort app, that will help growers to determine the dilute and concentrate rate required depending on the canopy density, row spacing. And you can get that on the app store. So that's the Syngenta Hort app. There's also another comment from Syngenta in that they aren't only looking at QOI resistance, but all resistance in downy mildew. So another, just a comment generally. And the last question we've got is, a question about who to contact to get resistance development project outcomes. I've seen a project report. I'm pretty sure I accessed it via the Wine Australia website. Um, if you want to email the help desk, um, I can send you a link to that report, uh, but I don't have those details right in front of me just now. Um, I guess the only last thing, and I know we've said to contact Ismail, Ismail in the first instance, if you have a resistance question, um, I don't know, Barbara, if you have any comments uh, at the end about getting the sample, taking the sample, submitting the sample, or is it just a question of contact Ismail and speak to him about what you've got and how to handle it? If, if you contact Ismail, he, um, he can send people all the details about how to collect the sample and how to send it. Um, it within the project, they've done a lot of work in, on how to send samples um, correctly so that they actually arrive at the laboratory in a usable state because certainly when we first started the project the high proportion of samples we received weren't actually able to be tested 
Um, so he's got all that information. It'd be best to contact him. Thanks very much. Okay, so up on your screen, you should now have the post webinar survey. We'd be interested, please, if you could answer that question that's come up. Um, I would just like to now finally thank Barbara and Liz very much for providing those important insights into practical steps to counter fungicide resistance. Really appreciate that effort from both of you. I'm sure that the people who have attended today got a lot out of the session. And so I'd also like to thank the audience for logging in and for participating in our survey. As I said at the start, you will receive a link to view the recording of this presentation should you want to, and it'll be available on the AWRI's YouTube channel. The next webinar is on Thursday, the 20th of July. Dr. Peter Costello from the Australian Wine Research Institute will present on his area of speciality, which is malolactic fermentation, opportunities and limitations. If you'd like to register for this session, please visit the AWRI website. Thank you again, and I look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Thank you. Thanks.